All right, hi everybody. Welcome to Telling Technology Stories with IPython Notebook. I'll try to have that be the last time I read something off a slide. Um, you can tell I'm more of a um, code level guy than a Photoshop guy by my great skills there with the uh, graphics, but let's see what we're talking about today. So what is IPython Notebook? Before I bore you with a long explanation, how many people have actually used IPython Notebook before or are aware of it? Okay, we have a couple of users. The aware of it caveat, I think, got more hands. Okay, cool. So this is a quick look at what the, uh, the notebook looks like, just so you have some idea of what we're talking about. It's, uh, it's, it runs in your browser, or it appears in your browser, and uh, it's got cells and fonts and color. Um, so why are we talking about it? It's a super useful tool. It's not really well known or used outside academia and science. The IPython um, guys did a survey recently, I think this year, and I think it was somewhere in the 70%. 70 percent of people who used it were either in one or two of those. It does uh, really help amplify how great the Python um, data and science ecosystems are. Um, and if it's useful for lots of use cases outside of the academia and the sciences. If you code at all, it's useful. Even if not in Python, actually, we'll see some of that. If you're a sysadmin, if you have to write technical documentation, if you blog, you do analysis, you might get a lot out of the notebook. So it's worth your time. So why am I talking about it? Um, well, I apologies to my baby daughter for photoshopping her brutally out of this uh, <coughs> this image. But I, I I work for a company called Media Temple. You've probably seen the name on your lanyard. Um, and I work. It's an internet services company, so I work and I do a lot of uh, just kind of ad hoc data analysis. And I was working on some reporting, and I stumbled into the notebook, and it changed my life. I, I tell people uh, it's the software that has excited me the most since I started using Linux in the first place. Um, so that's why I'm talking about it today. I'm not, I mean, I've done some small pull requests, but I'm not an IPython contributor or anything. Um, I'd like to be. Maybe that'll happen. But I'm just an enthusiast, so I'm sharing my love with you today. So why it's great. These attributes are going to come up over and over. Um, it is literate, and I'll explain a bit what I mean by that. It's interactive. So it's, it's a lot more interactive than your typical code flow. It allows incremental development, and we'll see a, an example of that as well. Uh, and it's highly visual. Because it runs in your web browser, you can see things in a lot more than ASCII uh, or Unicode. So what I mean by literate is kind of borrowing from Donald Knuth. Um, for the, I apologize to him for the oversimplification. But when we normally write software, kind of code is, it's code first, and then comments and documentation are second. I mean, obviously, if you're going to read something on read the docs or something, that relationship is inverted. Um, but usually, we sort of either have documentation and code, or we have code which contains writing. So IPython Notebook kind of lets you invert that paradigm. And it lets you talk about things and develop things with the story, that kind of human, human readable version of it first and the code as something that kind of uh, runs along with that. So um, yeah, in, in the Knuth world, it was really like documentation with code. And IPython Notebook kind of even goes a step beyond that, because you see documentation, code, and then a lot of times what that code does. You see the output in line, which is cool. So enough meta. Let's actually look at it. So installing it is super easy. Uh, caveat, if you have the dependencies, depending on um, what you need and what uh, OS you're on. Sometimes it can be a little bit complicated. But more or less, it's just pip install IPython, square brackets all, to get all the rest of the goodies that you're going to want for the notebook. Um, woo. Well, we're missing a slide there, but so be it. Um, how on earth did that happen? Um, OK, well, that's fine. Um, you just got uh, two steps ahead on the thing. so. I'm very confused by this now. I hope nothing else important is missing, but we'll get there. Um, so what happens is you start, you run IPython notebook in a, in a console, typically. And that actually starts a kernel process running. And what immediately happens is it pops up a browser window, which you should be looking at a picture of, uh, which shows you a, a directory browser of the directory that you started the process in. And so if that has files in it that end in IPYNB, IPython notebook files, you can open them up and be looking at the actual notebook. Um, any other files that your notebook creates, by default, are going to be just in that same working directory. And if you go back to the directory browser level, just um, it starts it on localhost port uh, 8888 by default. So if you look at that, you'll just see uh, all the files, all the notebooks. So it's a good way to kind of keep your data 
any images you create, and your notebooks themselves all together in one nice place. Um, so the IPython process actually runs a little IPython notebook process, runs a little web server. Um, it opens the web browser, points it at that web server, and then it keeps live communication going with a WebSocket. So when you're actually in the notebook and you tell it to run one of the notebook cells, notebooks are made up of cells, it actually sends the content of that cell over the WebSocket, uh, executes it down in the kernel, and then sends the results back to the browser for display. And meanwhile, is saving the not just the code you typed, but the output of the code, even if it's an image as a base64, um, in that IPY and B file. So what's cool about this pattern is it doesn't have to be local. So for a long time, I was trapped on a MacBook Air, and I was dealing with the, uh, data files that uh, loaded up into RAM would be 32 gigs or whatever. So a very common pattern is to SSH onto some uh, remote host that has lots more RAM than you might have on your laptop, um, run the process, and it works exactly the same way. So let's talk about a demo. Apologize for anyone who swore in their head when they saw Bill O'Reilly. Um, <clears throat> so first and foremost, the notebook is great for running code. But even before that, every cell, you click in it and it activates. You can see the little rubber band. So what's great is you can see up here, this cell type is markdown. And if I double click in it, you can see it's actually markdown. We've got the H1 tag and a bulleted list. Um, if I run the cell, it turns back into HTML. I'll show you running cells in a second. Um, so if you run any simple Python code, whatever the output is, appears immediately below the cell. There's a tab completion, which is handy, and integrated help. So if I type abs path question mark, um, it actually pops up the, the help, which you know it's all good for us to know that OS path abs path returns the absolute path. That was Critical information for all of us. Um, but if you do, uh, if you just start typing parentheses and you wait for a second, it will, and you wait for a second, it will give you um, a pop-up. So if you start opening a, opening a brace and you forget what argument something took by the time you realize you've forgotten, it will be telling you what it needs. Um, if you make an error, it's actually kind of nicer than getting a terminal dump so zero division error. You've got this nice kind of shows you the line, color coded. It's all very nice. Um, but what's extra cool is, let's see if I run this cell. It ran a few times. I'm dividing 10 by all the things in this range. I'm getting this variety of outputs. But oh no, it hit a zero division error. So if you have a cell that's throwing an error, this is one of the great features from the IPython project, not the notebook itself. You can just type debug right there. And now you're running an interactive debugger. So if I hit next, 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 oh, mm. sorry, it debugged it at the exception, which is what I actually wanted. Uh, so I can say it stopped it at the exception, so we can poke around a little bit and say, oh, print the value of div. Oh, it's a zero. Now I kind of knew that because of what the exception was. Um, but in a more practical example, that's really useful. One pro tip, if you're running uh, with the debugger, this trips me up on the regular. Um, the debugger, you can see this asterisk by the cell right here. That means that that cell is still running in the kernel. The kernel is busy dealing with that cell. Um, so you actually need to tell the debugger to quit or continue so that the asterisk is gone before you go on and do other things with your notebook. Otherwise, things won't work. Um, so we are working in a web browser. So we're not stuck with just a regular old uh, text and things like that, we can do animated GIFs, adorable wombats at your fingertips. Um, and uh, this is just a teaser. We'll talk more about this kind of stuff as well. But um, a lot of the objects that you can work with in Python have hooks so that they play nice with IPython Notebook. So you can do things like, hey, uh, give me some evenly spaced numbers between 0 and 5, and then square them all, and then show me a plot of x versus y in red. And there's a plot. Um, so as you can imagine, this is a very convenient capability. The other thing that I love about the notebook that they really improved in version 2 is the keyboard shortcuts. So you don't really have to um, do a lot of mouse work. You can uh, do a lot of things. So the kind of if you're used to either Vim or Gmail, you'll enjoy uh, JK being at your fingertips to go up and down the shell. Um, 
And every time that you click on a cell, um, the inner key, because we're programming here, we actually don't want the inner key to do anything right away. We want the inner key to be at our service to go to a new line. So they've got a variety of different inner keys that you can type. So if you hit Control Enter, that actually runs the cell and then kind of comes back to where you're at. So Control Enter is just the loop back. But there's also Shift Enter, which runs the cell and goes down to the next cell that's below it, if there is one. And there's Alt Enter, which is the most common way to kind of quickly hack your way through a bunch of code iteratively. Alt Enter creates a new cell immediately under the one that you executed. Um, and we'll probably leave that there for there. We'll leave the page. Don't need to save it. Um, so I wanted to step back and kind of look at the big picture of what the notebook allows. So in the center, you've got this IPython notebook stack with the running process on your machine and the browser component. It lets you bring in all kinds of data. I, I mostly talked about data here, but um, I, I show other examples where you're not bringing in data. You're querying remote services, or you're um, importing a video, or something like that. It lets you do iterative, iterative development on that really rapidly, as you've seen already just in the quick demo. And then what it saves is this really cool file called uh, IPYNB, the IPython notebook file format. And what you can do with that is convert it into a whole variety of formats. So you can directly convert it to PDF, and they're really decent looking PDFs. Like, they kind of, uh, it, it uses LaTeX, so they look academic-ish. Um, you can convert them to, to HTML, uh, which is very handy because uh, you can do lots of other things with HTML. There are entire books, I think four at least and counting now, that are basically written with a series of IPYNB files and then compiled to HTML and then books are generated from them, which is great because you can download the chapters and play with the examples uh, interactively. Another super common way uh, is to publish your IPYNB files to GitHub or just on the web um, and then People can either download them directly, or there's a third-party service called NB Viewer that we'll take a look at in a second that'll take the IPYNB files, render them to HTML, so people can see the actual production notebook um, as well as the source if they want to play with it themselves. And then the final thing that you can do with it is convert it an IPYNB file directly to Python, so you can convert it to a .py script. So uh, we were talking about this before the session started, but a very common workflow for me is to use that tool to kind of hack through and explore uh, something until I get it working, and then dump it to a Python file, refactor it, and then it goes into our mainline code base as something that's more repeatable. So this is uh, just a bit talking about how I fell in love with the notebook and, and the use cases that were really killer. I would get these requests in for some kind of ad hoc analysis or we're having trouble doing capacity planning on something. Um, so I'd crack open my editor, and I'd run the script. And like I said, when you're dealing with these large data files, just parsing all the date times uh, from a log file takes forever. Um, and uh, so it would take forever for a lot of these scripts to run. And then you'd generate maybe a bunch of visualizations or some other data, some crunch data. And then you'd look at it. Uh, it needs, has a problem, and then you kind of let, let me get back to my editor. There's lots of context switches there, too, because I'm in my editor, and then I'm like opening up an image viewer. And then when I was all done and everything worked, um, and the code was checked in and all that stuff, I'd have to write it up. So I'd like take these images that I generated, put them into a wiki and write it up, or send an email to the person that had the question. Um, but as I point out in the slide, it's, that's a very kind of slow and clunky process. And this is part of why I was so happy to find Notebook, because this is my new workflow, when I get a request like that, I crack open the notebook, I iterate on it rapidly. Um, if you're loading a file, you load the file in the first cell, now that file is loaded in your, name, in your running process, and you can just keep playing with it without having to reload it again. Um, then at the end, export HTML, it's built in. I've already kind of annotated it as I've worked on it. Uh, and then I can just dump that in email or a wiki, and, and we're done. Or cron I have one that's croned as an email that goes out automatically every day to a particularly fun person. Um, so normal iteration period uh, is, is uh, this whole loop. But when you're working with the IPython process, you're only really iterating right in that tiny little sweet spot of the code that you're working on right now and the problem that you're actually trying to solve. So I thought I'd show you kind of a, a walkthrough of where this kind of iterative, interactive programming is super useful. So uh, I asked myself, 
the other day. Uh, what are the most popular links being tweeted about at OzCon? And uh, that's our friend Luke Kniece from Puppet Labs here in Portland. Excited about how many people are at his party. So I thought uh, I'd show you. I just read this book a couple of months ago. It's great. Uh, I figured since we're at an O'Reilly conference, we should pitch their stuff. This book's called Mining the Social Web, and this is one of the books that's almost completely written in, in IPython Notebook. You can go to the GitHub repo and pull down almost any, um, any of the chapters, I think. I can maybe even able to take the almost out of there. Um, so I had never coded anything against Twitter before, so I, I used his technique with the slight alteration of not putting all my secret keys right in the slide. I loaded them from a JSON file. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so this code is basically lifted straight from him where, so this is the part that I'm not going to spend too much time on. If you're interested, the link is in the slides in the comments here. Um, but we're searching for OzCon. So what's cool, though, is that this code is building a list called statuses, which has all the search results. When you do a Twitter search, it's, it's got pagination. So this loop down here is just resolving the pagination. So just is loading all of the tweets that it can. Um, and it bails when there's no more to lead uh, to load. So yeah, I just copied that code. All I know now is I have this array called statuses that has a bunch of statuses that match search searches for OzCon. Okay, so let's take a look at one of what one of those looks like. This kind of blew my mind the first time I saw it. You know, a tweet is 140 characters, but a tweet is also all of this JSON. This is a single tweet. Um, so next time I go to a talk about Twitter scalability, I won't laugh quite as much. Um, but uh, anyway, this is impressive stuff, actually. So this is Tim O'Reilly's tweet from this morning. I reran. Uh, I didn't write the deck this morning, but I just reran these examples this morning, uh, so they'd be timely. This is from the keynote. Um, Tim O'Reilly talking about uh, that we should get working on a real civilization now, which is cool. So I've got this tweet, and right at the top, I can see that there's a text attribute. So, OK, uh, let me try to get links out of the text attributes of tweets. That seems reasonable. Um, I wanted to point this out. A lot of notebooks violate PEP 8 early and often. Um, one thing that they do is, and it, it'll be really natural if you start using IPython notebook, is you need a module so you'll import it in the cell where you need it, as opposed to cleanly doing all your imports at the top and separating them by type. And um, so that is. The most annoying when you're trying to get someone else's notebook working, and the algorithm is basically run it till it errors. You figure out what import it needs, run it till it errors. Anyway, that's an area where I think we can improve uh, notebooks. But I am a little embarrassed by using an ugly regex to uh, pull URL looking things out of strings, but it works. But let's see what happens if I try applying that to all the results. So this is great. Uh, in notebook, I've just told it to uh, <clears throat> to. I've still got that statuses array. I haven't gone back out to Twitter. I'm just continuing to work iteratively with that same data. Um, so I'm going through the, through the statuses, and I try to do a find all. And it looks OK, but there's these weird things. Um, oh, it turns out that uh, <clears throat> slash u2026 is, anybody know what that is? That's an ellipsis in Unicode. So when a tweet gets truncated at the end, they throw in a dot, dot, dot. And if the last thing someone tweeted was a URL, it gets cut up. OK, so that's not great. What's cool, though, is I can go back to where I did that big JSON dump. I'm not going to go back to that slide. You can take my word for it. Um, but as I'm working on this in the notebook, that whole ugly JSON thing is right there. So I can go look at another tweet, or the same tweet, and say, is there another way to solve this problem? And uh, there it is. Uh, it looks like in entities, URLs, and there's a list of them, there's a field called expanded URL. Cool. So let's try that. So if I pick all those out with the list comprehension, it looks like, hey, these are actually a lot more plausible. None of them have the weird Unicode stuff in it. I've got a link to uh, Grohl, which is a pretty neat little Go-looking project for monitoring web apps that launched earlier. Um, a SlideShare link, a GitHub link. But then I've got these Buffly links. So that makes me think. Oh, a bunch of people are probably shortening their URLs before they put them into Twitter. So if I, what I want to know is the most popular things people are talking about. Let's see if we can resolve that. I don't want uh, two different links that are obscured in different ways through redirects. OK, well, let's try that last Buffly link. It turns out that the requests library is handy. If you just get it and check the .url field, um, you can see 
the final thing that it resolved it to after all the hops. Cool. So now I can just apply that, and then we'll see what we came up with. So I'm using a collections uh, counter in the collections object in the collections library, which is a standard, and it has this nice most common capability. So you've seen literally all of the code that did this extraction, but that found of the last 200 tweets on the OzCon tag, uh, the links disambiguated it and rolled up. And what's cool about this is that um, we were able to scroll up and down, check out the JSON, go down one path, go that didn't work, go down another path. We didn't hit Twitter more than once, just one hit to Twitter in the beginning to load the URLs. So if you're dealing with an API that has rate limits or something, you're not going to mess with that. It's a static data set, so that's handy because uh, a lot of times, if you can imagine developing this on the command line without that kind of cached results capability, every time you run it, it's going to get a different set of links and your, your code's going to behave slightly differently. Um, and you can even uh, keep developing if the conference Wi-Fi is saturated as long as you've got the, uh, <coughs> the, the get the first time. But that's kind of an unnecessary burn because the Wi-Fi is pretty good here. Um, the other thing that, that I like to do with these is even though I... Um, Oh, so um, IPython has this tool called nbconvert, which is the thing that converts those IPython notebook files into other, uh, other forms. So this is just showing that if I really wanted to have some sort of like top 20, 10 links capability as part of some API I was writing, then I really wouldn't want to keep an IPython notebook around and run that, plus all of my miss cues and backtracks. So um, you can just use this to convert it to a Python script, and that generates tweetrelief.py. I call this tweetrelief.ipython.notebook because I try to be punny whenever possible. Um, and uh, so there it is. There's the, and what's interesting is you can see that it took all of the non-code pieces of the notebook and it threw them in there as comments, which is handy when you're refactoring because at least if you wrote some descriptive stuff in Markdown, you can actually, that comes right over in, in comments, and you can um, use that to help you port. So um, the IPython project is a lot more than just the notebook, and it's been around for a lot longer. The notebook didn't come out to the, till the 0.12 uh, release of IPython. So I drew this little chart so you could see what's part of IPython proper versus the IPython notebook. So the I, IPython stands for Interactive Python, and so a lot of the stuff that's built into it is to help it be better at being interactive. So everything on the left there is the things that makes it superior to just running a strict Python REPL uh, on the command line. It's got these things it calls magic, and we'll see a few examples of those. Um, but they're just things that start with 1% or 2% signs that let you do something kind of automatically that ordinarily would take a bunch of code. It's got that tab completion inline documentation we looked at. It's got this ability to interact with the shell in a really clean way by starting things with an exclamation point. It uh, stores history. Uh, so you can you know hit up 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 and see the last things you did. I didn't realize until I'd been using Notebook for a while that it shares the same history if you use the same profile uh, between the Notebook and the REPL. So I was typing up 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 in the REPL to go back to something, and I was like, oh, I just typed that in a Notebook yesterday, and there it is. It has customizable profiles, and we'll talk a little bit about what you might want to customize. It's got this ability you probably saw uh, on some of the Notebook cells I showed you that it has like in square brackets 42. Um, every input and output row is numbered, so you can reference the inputs and outputs from other cells if you want to. Uh, and it has this big clustering and parallelism capability that we're not going to talk about today because I only have 20 minutes left. Um, and the notebook piece handles that running the process, hosting the web socket, hosting the web app. The notebook thing adds the ability to create those notebook files that we can convert into different formats. Um, and then also customize CSS and JavaScript, which we'll see. So a lot of the stuff that if you're using the notebook that you learn, especially the magic and things like that, if you fire up the REPL, you'll be able to use as well. So like if you get used to tab completion or the inline documentation, it's all there, which is handy. So this is one of the slides you didn't see that you were supposed to earlier. Um, but it's an important gotcha. So the, the fact that you're running this one process, and actually it runs one process per notebook, um, that you have open. So uh, if you, in a cell, set a value, x equals 5, OK, inspect x, it's 5. But then if you run this cell a few times, uh, suddenly x is not 6, it's 12. 
because we normally think of so software as running from top to bottom. But because every command is going down to the kernel, doing its thing, and spitting the result back, if you run cells in different orders, um, things don't always end up as you expect. So that's just something to be aware of that's bitten me a few times, especially if you're taking advantage of this. Cool, I talked to Twitter once and got this huge bag of data. Uh, if you mess with that bag of data, that bag of data stays messed with. That is definitely one advantage in running a script top to bottom every time. So, you know, there's lots of things you can do to deal with that. It's just important to know that that might bite you. This is a quick example of, uh, of the, man um, the IPython magic. So this one's called time it. It's a common question that comes up like, hey, I'm thinking about doing something in this way versus that way. Which way is faster? Uh, percent time it is just a nice little um, uh, benchmarking tool. So it runs it a thousand times, counts the best of three, and it tells you that, yes, it's definitely faster, faster to do a list comprehension than it is to create a list and append things. Hopefully we all intuitively knew that, but uh, there's proof. Actually, it's not proof. It's backwards. All right, never mind. Uh, <clears throat> I'm really going to be curious to look at that later. I'm glad I didn't just lie to you all. Um, if you want to know uh, about the magic, it's a little overwhelming. If you type percent ls magic, it shows you all the magic commands. So these are all the things that IPython wants to do for you to make your life better. Um, but if you do percent uh, command question mark, it will give you the, out, the documentation for it, just like it would any standard. Um, Python thing. So write file is actually a really handy one. If you want to uh, take whatever's in a cell and dump it to a file, that's, that's your guy. The IPython notebook format is actually really nice. It's totally clean, readable JSON, so uh, nicely indented by default and everything. So you can actually do things with those IPython notebook files if you want to. Uh, there's a command line tool called JQ, which is a little like Java uh, JSON query engine. So there's some tricks you can do if you wanted to like just look at the code cells. You can use JQ to filter those out and then grep through them, things like that. But yeah, even the images are stored in line as base64. So let's say uh, I give you a notebook to play with, and I've got this interesting matplotlib extension installed that you don't have. You can still see the output of those images in the notebook. You just couldn't recreate them until you install that extension. So I wanted to talk about some of the kind of use cases. There's the obvious one that almost always comes up of um, kind of data science. And now it's the, even the example that, that was my gateway drug. Um, so I just wanted to show you uh, <clears throat> a few actual use cases. Um, yeah, in the small print. If I did not permanently ruin your ability to hear the term big data without thinking of this image, I apologize, because that is my goal. Um, so I had a, the first time I gave this talk, or version of this talk, was an internal company talk. And I, I displayed this kind of piece of it using some uh, proprietary data, which I could not share. So this is the new example. There's a really awesome, I'm actually, I live here. Um, so it's, it's a little weird to commute to a conference. But um, <clears throat> the, in Portland, we have a really awesome site called Civic Apps which has tons of open data. It's not always the freshest. Like, we have this crime report. It's from 2011. But it's still pretty cool. Um, so this is just an example of using some of the really great capabilities that are built into or that integrate nicely with IPython Notebook. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to read the CSV file. And then I'm using this library that's fantastic for dealing with tabular data called Pandas. Normally, CSV reading is a pain. You have to worry about, is it Unicode? And it, like what's the separation? By default, Pandas has this fantastic version of it um, where I can just load the CSV file and tell it to show me the first two rows with the headings. And that's really cool. I can see I've got all these crime reports. Uh-oh, someone's violating some liquor laws. I've got it all coded by neighborhood, police district, latitude, longitude. OK. So let's just quickly use the group by capability in Pandas to look at the, uh, the top kinds of offenses that we have here in Portland. Oh, we are a very scary town, guys. Larceny, vandalism, and burglary. I'm very happy that kidnap almost barely shows up. And it's a little weird that there's more kidnappings than gambling. But um, <clears throat> so that's great. In, so it's two lines of code for the reading the CSV file in four lines of code, and one of those is putting the title on it to generate this actually pretty useful, readable bar chart. And uh, 
what's also great is if it's not quite right and I want to, nope, oh, I typoed the year, then cool, I can fix it. And it just happens in real time. Um, you can do all kinds of interesting things, like let's find the top neighborhoods that are a little sketchy. And if you live here, none of that is surprising. Um, <clears throat> I can add a new column where if it's in this top bad neighborhoods that's categorizing it as a rough hood, then I can look at my really boring neighborhood. What's all the bad stuff that happens there? Pretty much the same. Hey, no kidnapping in my neighborhood. I'll count that as a win. Um, so anyway, we don't need to go too far into depth on this stuff, but it's just to show you that it's um, you can interactively get all the way up to these really crazy visualizations. And believe me, uh, this one took a little bit of time. I didn't want to live code this um, to get it right. When you unpack it, it's not that bad, and about two thirds of it was stolen from Stack Overflow anyway. But um, this is actually a pretty cool visualization. You can see kind of the cross-indexed heat map of the neighborhoods versus the type of crime. So you can see there's a lot of larceny in downtown, uncharacteristically large amount of it. Um, so that's extremely handy. Um, and one thing that's a little odd you'll see is if you were trying to tell this story to someone else, and this is where the telling technology stories piece comes in big time, um, one is that I can, um, in this file alone, if I'm handing it to another developer, there's a huge amount of context and meaning that's wrapped around the lines of code. It's very clear what each little section of code is supposed to be doing. But the other thing is, if I want to give this to, let's say, a local politician to do something with, they're going to be like, what in God's green earth is all that noise? So we'll talk about in a minute um, what we can do about that piece. Because this is a great tool to be used uh, to use for almost kind of reporting and journalistic types of storytelling as well, not just with developers. Um, if you do want to know more about the data analysis piece, and I breezed over it, um, Sarah Guido, who I haven't met, but we tweeted each other last night, uh, is going to be giving a talk around the corner. Sorry, that sounded terrible. I was definitely not a double entendre. Um, the Around the corner, uh, F-150 later today, uh, in the very next session, she's going to be diving a lot deeper into uh, data with Python. And somebody went to her tutorial and said that she uses IPython Notebook as well, so you'll probably get to see more examples if this has scratched the niche for you. Um, so you can't always pair program. So um, code, code mentorship is actually something that I've got a lot of value out of this um, tool with, because the IPython Notebook files are just JSON. So they're easy to put on Git. They're easy to email around. Uh, they're easy to upload to a wiki. So. I had a friend who's, who I work with, I guess, a, another employee that was having a hard time understanding sets. So I was able to just sort of put some examples in, a, in an IPython notebook, send it over. And then if they're really uh, having a hard time with something, I found it's really useful for me to say, instead of let's just talk about it, get your problem in code, send me the notebook, and then I'll help you figure out how to bridge that gap and then I can send you a notebook back. So it's a really good token to sort of pass around to make people get their problems more concrete. Uh, but it's great. You can just uh, show demos. I also, there's a, an extension module called IPython Doc Tester, which I also found great for kind of having people, here's the kind, you need to write a function that does this, so you can uh, use the doc test syntax, which is pretty standard to Python. And, uh, and you can show that uh, <clears throat> the, it gives you this nice HTML output, which obviously the square of 4 is 16, but intentionally showing that it's 17 here um, to show a failing output. So that's handy. Uh, another thing that's great, I work, as I mentioned, in internet services. So IPython Notebook has these really useful tools for uh, interacting with the shell. So a lot of what we do, I found, I thought back when I discovered this kind of capability to the in, amount of wiki articles I'd written that involved me like running something in the console, trying to copy paste it with sufficient wrapping, putting it into the wiki, like shooting myself in the head, committing suicide in more e exotic ways. Um, so <clears throat> what's great is that you can talk to, it has this capability out of the box so you can use the exclamation point and this is really interesting what's happening in these three lines because I'm running ls-l. It's putting it into a Python array. It's using 
a Python, the Python list grep command to look for IPYNB files. And then the dollar syntax here is taking a Python variable and giving it back to a shell command. So, and it, this is not something you would actually want to do in real life, but it's, it's showing you the kind of really nice integration you can have to work with commands versus Python code. Um, so that's just a list of all of the, I hope there's nothing. Okay, yeah, that's probably fine. Uh, <clears throat> that's just showing you the kind of capabilities you have. Um, there's also a bunch of magic that is really useful for assisted mini types uh, who are trying to write up processes. So you can start something with percent percent bash. That's one of the magics. And that'll actually send it down to your kernel and then run it inside bash. So only bash can do this kind of really interesting double brace expansion. And here we go. That's something that's actually been run by bash. Same deal. If our friends around the corner wanted to do something in Perl, um, you can uh, quite happily run Perl code. Obviously, you have to have a Perl environment on your machine that works. Um, but here's another example of the kind of, hey, I want to show someone this awful shell transform that gets used a little too regularly to find what's happening on some log. Um, I just type it. It actually runs it on my machine and captures the output ready for me. And then I'm done. That's great. Um, So the other thing that's actually kind of sick about that is that you can write up an executable process. If there's a manual process you have to do that's not yet covered by configuration management or something, you can put that in a notebook, and people can run it cell by cell, check the output to make sure it's sane. Um, and so it's, it's actually kind of like a, a way to put processes kind of on rails, but with a good like, oh, I can see exactly what went wrong if it ever does fail. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I've talked about a few times is wiki publishing. So um, you can do something in the notebook, nb convert it to HTML, and then just copy paste it into most rich HTML editors. And uh, you can be very happy that you didn't have to do that all by hand in the painful way. Another thing that you can really do excellently, and you may have inferred this already from the kinds of examples I've shown, that Portland crime thing, that would make probably a pretty good blog article if I wanted to. Um, so, I mean, to a certain kind of uh, interesting person. I didn't actually write this blog, but the guy who wrote my AI textbook in college did, so that's awesome. Peter Norvig is the research director at Google now, um, and he wrote this blog about XKCD, and uh, he kind of, in, XK, in this XKCD comic, he posited this, this uh, question about the shortest possible regex that matches a set of things, and so he explored it in, uh, in the context of a blog. But that was an IPython notebook file. So here is a local copy of the notebook, and the entire thing is executable. I can see his whole exploration of it. So especially if you're talking about tech technology first topics, the same thing about you don't want to copy paste output is super handy. Um, blogging with IPython notebook is actually a joy. And if you, especially if you're a Python person, there's Nicola and Pelican are two really solid Python blogging engines, and both of them. Um, you can extend pretty easily to work with IPython notebooks. So you literally just open the notebook, create one in the directory that you want, write it up, and then hit publish blog and however you normally publish your blog, and it will handle dumping it to HTML, putting it in your normal theme, and uploading it along with everything else. So I talked about how you really wouldn't want to uh, show all that cluttery stuff to, let's say, I call this the boss mode CSS file. When you run nb convert to convert something to HTML, you can put a custom.css file in that directory, and it will render it out. Um, so if you tell it to hide these three things, uh, these three types of cells, and these slides will be on the uh, OzCon site, so you don't have to copy this down, um, you'll get a really nice, clean, code-free, only the output and your markdown uh, rendering of the data. I put in bold there, annoying caveat, because uh, <clears throat> There is the problem that when you open those HTML files, it tries to load a file in the HTML file called custom.css. So it will render fine in your browser, but you can't send that HTML file to someone else. It inlines a bunch of the CSS, but not the custom stuff. So what I almost always do is open it and then print to PDF and send someone the PDF. Um, the other thing you can do to clear up the clutter is if you've got some you know, big, gnarly chunk of code that does the bulk of the work, and then mostly what you're doing is just graphing it in different ways, you can put that in a separate notebook, and you can use a magic that's called run, so percent run. That'll actually run the other notebook in your running kernel 
uh, so that you get all those variables defined. It just doesn't show you any of the output. Uh, and then from there, you've got all those variables, and you can proceed to, uh, to visualize it. The other thing you can do is move code to a, a local module um, uh, and then import it from there or use a custom output template. So this is kind of how that um, crime report looks with the, with the boss mode CSS applied as a PDF. Uh, we can skip this for now. Uh, one neat thing that uh, IPython does is it looks at any object that you tell it to that's the last item uh, on a cell. If you basically, it's the last thing in a cell, it'll try to print it. But it checks for these extra properties on that object and tries to load a different representation of it. So you can do an HTML representation, SVG. So that's how the pandas data frames showed up as nice kind of HTML-y tables. That's because pandas data frame has these extra representation um, features. So if I create an object called fancy text and I tell it that the HTML representation is this nasty inline style, then I can create a fancy text object called hello OzCon and I get the worst use of CSS3. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about uh, is automated testing. And it's still early days on that, but it's definitely possible at this point, if you have a bunch of IPython notebook files, to put those into your automatic testing framework. There are a few kind of gists out and about, uh, link to, that will let, like, if you're using pi.test, you can have it discover every cell as a test and then die if they have any exceptions. But it's kind of weird, because notebook isn't code in the way that we normally think about it. Um, but it turns out, yeah, if you, if you run one of those on the uh, XKCD thing, the tests actually mostly pass, but they do have one failure, so <clears throat> I'll have to get on Norvig about that. Um, customization is also, there's tons of ways to customize. We've seen a few in passing, but um, IPython has this profile thing. You can configure all kinds of things. Like anything that it does is probably configurable. You can also inject custom CSS into the actual GUI you work with if you don't like the default look and feel. Uh, you can load custom JavaScript. So people have, like people using it to blog have added publish buttons in their blogs um, that call a JavaScript thing. Um, NB convert, as I showed, you can customize as well. I put in red up there the run arbitrary code and always import modules. So if you're just using this as a private kind of lab, it can be really handy to say, I always want these four modules to be loaded. but if you do that and then you share your notebook with someone else, they're going to get really weird errors because your notebook didn't explicitly say to import those and they have no way of knowing uh, what you're using. So this is just a quick example of uh, adding some custom JavaScript. If you're interested in that, you can check the slides. But yeah, you can do all kinds of crazy things with the JavaScript. Um, so anything that you call from JavaScript, ipython.notebook.kernel.execute, it's the equivalent of you running that in a cell, so it sends it down to the kernel and runs it. So you can totally use JavaScript to screw yourself, which is why in IPython 2, there's this whole trust and security model that they've introduced, because you do need to be a bit careful if you download random uh, notebooks off the internet. You're giving them the ability to run code as you on your machine. Um, so just to show a less scary example before we uh, close up here, I had them hook up the speakers for this one. Hello, IPython notebook fans. There we go. So I'm calling the say command on my local system and uh, send you this nice message. And uh, so I think we'll, we'll wrap it there. There is the custom CSS. I did want to just touch on uh, the notebook sharing. So the best, most common pattern that I've seen a lot of people use, if you've got a notebook, especially one that has a lot of data with it, if you put the whole thing in a GitHub repo or some public place, with data, like basically your whole directory that you started the notebook process from. Um, and then you, you can just link, you can go into this website, nbviewer.ipython.org, and put the link to any of your notebooks in your GitHub repo, and it will display them nicely. And not only will it display them, but it gives people the ability to drill back to your original GitHub. They can clone it if they want, or they can even just drill around nbviewer. The second layer here, nbviewer, has its own directory browser. So if you wanted to let somebody see your source data or anything, that's a really e easy way uh, to do it. And the one last thing that IPython Notebook does that I didn't talk about uh, is that it does slide decks. So this whole deck was made in IPython Notebook. So this is the IPython Notebook version of the slide deck. Um, and so every slide is a cell. If you wanted to do a show something next, 
kind of thing, you can do that. Um, so yes, this, this will be in the links as well. But um, it's a really handy way to quickly get up and uh, put something on screen in front of people. Um, and yeah, it's, it's pretty easy to do. You just check something in the toolbar and say, turn on the slideshow controls. And that lets you tell if each, if each cell is a slide or a fragment that goes on the next piece. Uh, and that's it. So there's other uh, resources. If you want to install it, it's just a pip install away. But Anaconda is great if you are uh, if someone's trying to get it running on Windows or something. And IPython Notebook is easy to install, but a lot of the stuff that you might want to do with it is not so easy. So if you're a Docker fan, there's a really great, um, well-supported Docker IPython module um, that will build all the nasty stuff for you. It takes about 30 minutes and will heat up your room to build the image the first time. Um, but it's, it's an easy way to get going. And then don't forget F-150 around the corner if you want to learn more about data. All right. <laughs>